So upon invitations, I travel. I do a full-time job at Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corp, whatever all that means, a Japanese bank. And I've been doing what I currently do, not at that bank, but other banks, starting at Manufacturers Hanover Trust, work my way through Chemical Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Fuji Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, and now Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corp. Doing the same thing, basically. The number one question everybody asks, well, where is this guy from? That's the first question. Well, let me tell you who I am, where I'm from. I was born and raised in British Guyana, South America. Everybody's like, I thought you were Indian. Never went to Indian, can't speak the language, don't know anything. <laughs> if I go to DR, people say, something in Spanish, I, what did you say? Can't figure it out either. I am who I am. I want to take you back to that day, that infamous day, September 11, when all hell broke loose. I want to take you back to that day when I never thought that I would see the light of another day. I want to take you back to that day when the eagle cried. When we took for granted that we were impenetrable. When the bad guys were hiding like a lion seeking whom to devour. I want to take you back to that day when I call on God, and he heard, and he answered, and sent help. And had it not been for the divine grace of God, and that one good man who stopped to investigate, I would not have been here today. I've been interviewed by every television, major television, radio, newspaper around the world. And I tell the same story of God's deliverance. But nobody never stopped to ask me, well, what was passing through your wife's mind? By the time I finish, I hope you have all the answers and everything in between. I would start very slow, and as for time, I would speed up the process, so bear with me. And I want to give you a roller coaster tour from Elmont, Long Island, where we live, outside of New York City, to lower Manhattan and back. But I want you to stop for one second and close your eyes. Just close your eyes. And I want you to open it back. And what you just saw that darkness was what I saw. That's what I saw, just darkness. I want to tell you that we serve a God who hears and answers prayers. And we have heard this so many times that we take for granted. All right, so I'm a church goer, so God hears and answers prayers. Whatever he answers is fine with me, and I'm okay. You take for granted. But when you would have gone through what I went through, the Bible becomes alive. Scriptures becomes real. And you know you serve a God who is big and powerful and mighty and who can do all things. The God that we serve. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. So fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. So we live in this little town, Elmont, in Long Island. I worked at the time for Fuji Bank Limited. I work as an assistant vice president on the 81st floor of two World Trade Center, the second tower, the last one that got hit, the first one that went down. We had this little house, two bedrooms, two daughters, my wife, Stephanie and Caitlin, the two girls, and Jennifer, my wife, we call her Jenny. Men, this is for you. You know what happens when you have one bathroom in the house and you have three girls? Well, that's me. I'm taking a shower, I'm praying the same prayer I carried around in my heart many, many years. Lord, cover me and all my loved ones under your precious blood. Take us to work, bring us back home in peace and safety. All right, that's all I'm saying. Over and over and over, don't know why. Jenny is fixing her hair, and this is what she's telling me. Stan, I'm having a bad hair day. Ladies, what is a bad hair day? I can't figure that out. <laughs> so this is what she's telling me. I'm like, okay. And I'm telling her, well, I'm going to wear my khakis and my white shirt. And I'm going to wear my lucky shoe. Stan, please don't wear that shoe. I don't go to the store. I sit down outside and hold the bags, and she shops. That's me. When I bought the shoe, the only thing I ever bought, she said, was an ugly pair of shoe. Today, I'm wearing this just like your pastor, same color pants, same color belt. And like, he, had alone, he alone got the memo or something. <laughs> but 
I'm telling her, she says, Stan, for that kind of money, $109, I could have gotten you a Clark, a Bostonian, a Bash. And she's going on, I don't even know the names of these things. $109, Stan, it's ugly. I'm like, all right, all right, I'm going to wear that ugly shoe. The shoe was in a box. The shoe was still in a box. If you were to look at it at the bottom of the sole, you would understand what I'm saying. Had I not worn that shoe, chances are I would not have been able to walk again with the little pieces of glass and everything that is embedded in the sole. And around the shoe box, the word deliverance is written all around it. And it's a reminder of where I've been and what the Lord did for me. And I told her, she says, why do you put the shoe in a box still? I said, if ever I get cold, I want you to bring me back and show me where I was and what the Lord did for me. I'm going to wear that shoe. So she's not a morning person. I put on my clothes and I jump into my little old car and I drove to the borough of Queens, park up, took the A train, two and a half hours Total commute one way, I'm in lower Manhattan. Yes, five hours per day. Still do. So when I hear people who can't come to church because they live 10 minutes away, I smile. <laughs> and I'm singing here to the choir. You guys are the wonderful people who, who are here, right? I'm not talking about you all, the ones who didn't come. So, stop in the same bagel store. As soon as I walk in, the lady said, toasted raisin bagel and a cup of coffee, right? $1.25, here you go. Wow. Same thing I ate for 13 years working in that building every single morning. Same thing. Every single day, eat the same thing. Even at home. Stan, what do you want for dinner? I tell her the same thing that I had yesterday. So after 10 years, 15 years, uh, next year, 30 years, she stopped asking me what you want for dinner tomorrow. <laughs> Pushes the button. Less than 45 seconds. I'm on the sky lobby on the 78th floor of the second building. Came out, walk across the hallway, local elevator, 81st floor. Walk all the way from north side to the south side, down the hallway. At the end of that floor, made a right, huge glass office. I shared it with many other people, so it was not a private office. A young lady is making copies of the copier, Delise Seriano, saying, how you doing? I'm special, thank you. See, my ex pass used to tell us, anybody ask you how you're doing, you tell me you're special. And they would turn around and they would give you a look. <laughs> and in New York City, when you ask somebody how they're doing, before you answer, they're gone. But if you tell them you're special, they would laugh. And he said, you just witnessed to somebody. So I took that to my job. So I worked with a bunch of Buddhists and Bushidos and Shintos and Catholics and the rest of the others. So I took my job, my religion, very seriously. My Bible was always on top of my desk. We exchanged pleasantry. I had two desks. This is where the phone is. And about six feet away, this is where I'll be sitting. Where I sat in the office, if I was to sit on the desk here and swivel around in the chair, an angle to my right is the Brooklyn Bridge. Statue of Liberty, Jersey City, overlooking the Hudson. Spectacular view. Part of the North Tower, first tower, North we call it One World Trade, the North Tower. So, wonderful view. The phone rang, picked it up. My mother is on the phone. Stan, how you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Three other brothers, Steve, Paul, Bill, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? I'm fine, thank you. It's not even 9 o'clock. There's a lot of love here. What's going on? That's my thought. Not realizing the first building was hit, didn't have a clue what it was. I was in the elevator coming up. The building is safe, it's secured, it's Soundproof, you can't hear what is happening outside. So the first building was hit, way up on top. As I'm putting my briefcase and the coffee and everything right there, I just happened to look towards my right, and what I saw was chunks of fireballs falling from the sky. So I woke up, stood at the ledge, and I'm looking up. My God, what is happening? So I said, Delise, come here, come here. So she came, she's looking, and we're looking. I said, oh God, Stan, I'm scared. I walk back to the phone, I pick up the phone, I'm dialing Peter Del Grasso, my boss. Pete San, pick up. San in Japanese is Mr. or Sir. No response. I'm dialing his boss, Bobby, um, Bob Militaglio. Bobby, pick up. No response. We got to get out of here. <laughs> Ran out the office, back the hallway, punches the button. We are back now on the 78th floor, the sky lobby. Multiple elevators, hundreds of people. This was a massive, massive building, one acre square. 110 floors, 
A lot of people cannot understand or fathom the height or the magnitude of that building if you haven't seen a building like that before. Some of you may have seen and you understand what I'm talking about. But it's hard for me to explain a giant building like that to folks who the tallest building have seen maybe a four-story building. So anyway, we were told that if you were to drop a penny from the observation deck, it would have the same force as shooting a 38 at point-blank range. And when you look down, every car, trucks, and buses, they look like tiny matchboxes. And planes flew at the same altitude. So we're at the 78th floor. The elevator door opens up, and they open right in front where I was standing. All right. Multiple elevators, many people, and here I am standing up right there. And the next thing I know, we stepped in that office. We stepped in that office, and 18 other people, Delisa and I, 20 of us, went in the door closes, and less than 45 seconds, we're down. The doors open up, I stepped out. Well, the doors open both sides of the, of the elevator. As you go in the open front, it goes open at the back. So we stepped out there, and there's a little turnstile with the security guards. And I stepped out of the elevator, and the security guard says, where are you going? He says, I'm going home. Had I known that the first building was hit by a plane, chances are I would not have gone back in. But I didn't know. And you can hear the whoop whoop sound and the signals, your building is safe, it's secure, go back to your office. You can hear it over and over and over. And I asked the Secret Service one day at a secured meeting someplace, and I asked, I said, is it possible, just remotely possible, that Al-Qaeda infiltrated the system and they were told to send everybody up to have maximum casualty? Stan, you may be onto something, but we don't have a clue, don't know. But anyway, your billing is safe, it's secure, go back to your office. The young lady says, Stan, I'm scared, I want to go home. Take the rest of the day off. One of the guys in the elevator, Stan, how can you do this? We have an operation here to run. No, no, I'm running the operation, you're going home. And that was the end of that. That was the first time I spoke to my bosses like that, and it felt good. <laughs> and, and this young lady, she's walking away. And as she's walking away, She's looking back at me, you should go, go, go. Had I not sent her home, chances are she would not have been here today. But she's gone. And the doors are closing, and Manny Gomez is leaning against one, do one door, and Jack Andriacchio against the next door, preventing it from closing. You know the elevator doors are closing, you stand against it, it just stop. Come on, stand the man. We don't have all day here. And I still don't know why I should be scared. Don't know. Like I said, had I known that the plane had hit the first building, I would not have gone in. So I'm deciding what to do. And I'm stepping into the elevator. And as I'm stepping in, it might be surprising what the mind does to the body. I'm reliving 1993 when the truck bombed the place. February 26, I think. It was just around one o'clock. I remember my supervisor at the time, she had ordered Chinese food. I remember what we were eating, pork chops and rice, Chinese cabbage, and a hard boiled egg plop in the middle. And she sat across from me on a table on the 79th floor, and the next thing I knew, boom, 12 pounds of explosive in a pickup truck. The man walks away, presses the remote control, and the bomb exploded. And within seconds, the, the, the smoke rose through the vents. The lights flickered, and the place went dark, and all hell broke loose. You heard that cliche, that proverbial phrase, well, you haven't seen it. And you would hear everybody would tell you, all the firefighters, when they come to give you that one hour little lecture, oh, drop, roll, go down lower floors. They sent us to higher, higher floors as the smoke rose. And I was one of the firefighters, you know, a fire warden for my floor. So what was that? Anyway, we found ourselves on the 84th floor. And the next thing you know, I got home 2 o'clock. The next morning, Sister Jenny thought I died. Didn't have a cell phone. So all I'm reliving this thing, I remember when the bomb exploded, this lady is screaming, how can you sit and eat at a time like this? We're going to die. Snap out. And I clean that pork chop pastor. I says, if I'm going to the Lord today, I'm going with a full stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and I ate that food, and the lucky thing I did because I got home 2 o'clock. So I'm reliving this whole thing. I step in the elevator, the door closes. And the next thing I know, I'm back on the sky lobby. 
I still remember the smile on the faces of all these people in the elevator, not realizing this is the last smile I'd ever have. I still remember Alicia Levin, she's looking at me smiling, and I'm telling Kawauchi, I says, come on, man, a warm day you have your sweater tucked in your khakis, come on. And everybody, come on, Stan, and they're, they're laughing. And I'm looking at the faces of everybody, not realizing I would never see these folks again. And we were zoomed up. We got out at the 78th floor, and one man walks in front of me. The man was out of a job, and my boss took compassion, and his family hired him as a consultant. First week on the job, he forgot his laptop, and he's going for it. And the man walks in front of me, he walks into the men's room, and I never saw the man again. Now, I want you to tell me what should I say to the son and the daughter and the wife who called, did you see my dad? And I was left with that survival, survival guilt. Well, Jeremiah said in the book of Lamentation, chapter 3, verse 1, I'm the man who saw the destruction of God's wrath. Well, I saw the destruction, and I'm doubly blessed to see the rebuilding process. So I saw the destruction, and I saw the rebuilding of the Freedom Tower. And I walk back into the office, and the phone is ringing again. And the phone is ringing, and I reach for the phone, and a young lady from Chicago, one of our rep offices, picks up the phone over there, and she says, this is what she says, get out. Get out for what? Stan, you don't have the time. Please go, go, go. You got to tell me why. I'm a logical-minded person. You tell me, go, I can't go. You're not logged on to the computer. You're not watching the monitor. You're not listening to the radio. Stan, get out. No, we don't have time. Please, please, please. No, no, no. Tell me why, and I would go. She is sitting down home. She knew at this point it's a terrorist attack, and she saw the plane coming on TV. And I just happened to raise my head, not knowing why, looking towards the Statue of Liberty. And what I saw first was a speck that got bigger and bigger and bigger by the microseconds. And what it was is a great plane. You, United Airways, on the tail and the wing, you're bearing down on me. I level of contact. It's one thing looking at a plane going, to, uh, going away from you, but this plane is coming towards me. And as the plane is coming, it's getting larger, larger, larger. And all I remember saying without thinking anything, I says, Lord, I can't do this. You take over. And with a split second, I dropped the phone screen and dove under the desk. And that's the last scream the young lady heard, and this, uh, the connection was severed. And she thought I died. And she could never go back to work after that because all she heard was that scream, and she assumed I died. If you were to beat me over the head and ask me why I said what I said, I... Couldn't tell you because I don't know. All I said was, Lord, I can't do this. You take over. And the bottom wing took out the 79th floor, the top wing, the 82nd floor, and that big orange load that you see there, I'm in the middle center of that big flame. Upon impact, it looked like somebody took a giant bag of cement, threw it in the air. The air got so thick I can't breathe. The floor above me, the, uh, the 82nd floor collapsed, and it's hovering like this. One way or the other, I'm dying. I'm going to die. All the windows are popping. The air pressure was sucking everything out. And the people who you see jumping, chances are they were sucked out by the air pressure. The, fly, the, the fire's encroaching. You can hear it licking up the office space. I got temporarily deaf because of this sound. Boom! The sprinkler system came on, and all the cables that are hanging in the ceiling dropped, and they're short-circuiting. One way or the other, I'm dead. The only desk that stood firm is the dust desk I'm hiding under. My Bible was on top of that desk. It looked like a demolition crew came and ripped the entire place apart. And I'm hiding on the desk. I poke my head out and realizing that the floor is hovering. I'm going to die. And I'm screaming, Lord, please send somebody, anybody to help me. And I'm wondering why these folks didn't help me, not realizing everybody died. And I was by myself. Everybody died upon impact. Everybody who was in that office was gone. And that split second, somebody heard that petition at the other end of the floor, and they had a flashlight shining it all around like this. Couldn't shine it straight through, but over his head. And even though the person is saying, look, I'll wait for you, I couldn't hear. I got temporarily deaf. And I'm screaming, Lord, please, please don't leave me to die. What is going to befall my wife and our children? Who's going to walk Stephanie and Caitlin down the aisle when they get married? Please, Lord, I don't want to die. And I could never understood, never understood why Sarah prayed for 25 years for a child and why Hannah is crying out for a man-child. 
And while Rachel is having all the babies, uh, Rachel is barren, and Leah is having all the babies, I can't understand. But Stanley called on God and he heard. And help is right at the end in the floor. I, I don't understand. I start to crawl. One floor was like one acre square. I crawled the entire length of the loans department through the lounge, in the computer room, in the communication room, and one lousy sheetrock wall stood firm. Why that sheetrock wall? I always ask that question. Why? One sheetrock wall stood firm. And as I got closer to the wall, I can hear faint the person saying, if you want to live, climb over, hollow ceiling. I tried to jump the first time, missed. And part of the hanging loose sheetrock just caved in and trying to prevent, from, prevent it from hitting my face, I raised up my hand and a black sheetrock screw just went straight through my palm. When I winced, the man said, what happened? I said, a nail went to my palm, bite it out, can't do it. Is it attached to a piece of wood? Yes, he says, well, hit the wood, the nail is gonna come off. The nail came off. I was in worse shape than before. And I'm crying out to this God who I've heard so much about. And I'm crying out to this God, this invincible God, this big and powerful God. Lord, if you wanted me to die, why did you bring me all the way here to leave me? And I'm remembering Joshua 7, 7, he is asking the same question. Why did you bring us over to Jordan to be slaughtered by the Amorites? Why, why, why didn't you leave us on the other side? And I'm asking God that same question. Why, God, if you wanted me to die, why did you bring me here to leave me? What is going to befall Jenny and all these bills that we have? Who is going to take care of these children? Lord, I don't want to die. And this man is hearing this conversation that I'm having with this invisible God, and he thought I was crazy. He later thought, he said, Stan, in an interview with CNN and BBC and the CBS, I'm quoting, he said, I really thought you were crazy. He said, I was asking him if he was saved. Why would I ask a man he was saved in that time? He said, I was asking him, I don't remember anything. All I remember was I can hear in my head very vividly, Pastor Jim is crazy screaming and preaching his heart out, and he's saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That all, that's the only thing I can hear over and over in my head. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the man is saying, I can't hear you. Please climb over. You're going to die. And this flame is getting closer and closer and closer. You can hear the crackle of the flames, and it was just licking up the office space, and the sprinkler system was on. And I'm down on my knees, and I can't go further. And all I remember, I'm caressing this wall, and I don't know why. And I made a fist as tightly as I could. And I punched with such force. And my fist passed through that sheet rock wall. I punched with such force, and it went straight through. And the next thing I know, the man grabbed my fist. He said, I see your hand. I said, when you see my head, he yanked my body through. I punched, the hole got bigger. Punch, the hole got bigger, and I stuck my head, and this man gave me a headlock, one fluid motion, and he pulled, and I squirmed with such force, and I flew on the other side. I knocked him off his feet, and we rolled on 10 flights of stairs, and we landed on the 80th floor. And I don't know how to thank this man who just saved my life, but when I found myself, I was lying on top of this guy, I just hugged him around the neck and gave him a kiss on the cheek. He said, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and he got up, and he fixed his tie and his jacket, and he says, Brian Clark, that's all he said, like a robot. And I said, Stanley Premier. And this guy just held on to my hand. And he took his left index finger and he started rubbing this wound. And I'm like, this guy is crazy. Now, how does he know if I'm not HIV positive or anything? He's rubbing this wound. And this guy stared me in the eyes and he told me something, Pastor, that I'll go to the grave with. He said, all my life I live as an only child. I was born and raised in Canada. I always wanted a brother, and I find that man today. And this good old Irish man put his hand around my shoulder. He says, come on, buddy, let's go home. And we started this long journey home. You see, we didn't look indifferent because we were covered by the same ash. 
Today, that man assumes the role as a big brother towards me. He remembers the anniversaries and the birthdays and everything else. And the children call me Uncle Stan. A bunch of Irish kids calling a brown man uncle something is wrong here. <laughs> but I was their bruncle, the brown uncle. So I got my big brother, and we started this long journey home. You had to walk 10 flights of stairs, turn in a little landing, 10 flights of stairs, and then you cover one floor. We had 80 floors to go. Brian later told me that they were coming down with a group of six other people. The people saw what was happening, heard a scream, something worse was happening. They ran back up and made the wrong choice. They all perished. Brian stopped the investigator to help me, and he lived. Brian said he was covered in a bubble. He was glued to the floor, and even though he wanted to move, and I'm quoting him on BBC, he said he couldn't have because something powerful glued him on. And in my heart, God had sent this man to save me. This is my guardian angel. We stopped at the 45th floor. I was in the best shape of my life. We stopped. I couldn't breathe. He had his hand around me. I had a large leg wound that was opening up. I was hobbling down, and I'm hurrying him. We got to go. This building is going. What building? Stan, what do you see burning here? He's all draperies and cosmetic and paper. Steel don't bend. I'm an engineer by profession. You're in shock. Snap out. And we're hobbling. We got to hurry. We got to hurry. And I don't have a clue what going means. What is going, Stan? And he stopped on the 45th floor, and he put his hand on, on, against the door. There was no heat. Open up the door, walks in, picks up the phone, and he is telling his wife, Diane. I can hear the conversation. I've got this guy here from Fuji. He's in bad shape. I've got to take him home, but we're coming home. And while he's saying that, something caught my attention. There's a man lying down, broken back, massive head injury, closely shaved head. You can still see the blood and the bubbles oozing out. And this guy is crying, the same cry. Please tell my wife and our baby that I love them. And every night, every night that I sleep, just before that period of falling asleep and waking, I can hear that cry. And I can't help that man. And there's an African-American security guard who stood by and guarded this man with his life. He could have escaped. He chose to stay. And together they perished. They were gone. Never saw them again. We're dialing the numbers, please send help. And they were rerouting the calls and nobody came. And I reached for the phone and I called my wife's boss at the time, a lady named Louise. I said, if you get in contact with Jenny, please tell her that I'm on my way home. I'm coming home. Louise was in tears. She left and gone, and Jenny did not hear from her. And Jenny was going to work. She came out of the subway. The first building was hit. They're watching the episode, the, the spectacle. And as she went in the office, and they're watching the first building on flames, the second plane hit the second building, and knowing where I work, she assumed I was a goner. So when the plane hits the building, one of the ladies says, come on, let me take you home. And she says, I can't go further. They sat in a little park area. The lady gave, him a cup, gave her a cup of tea. And they sat down there, and she said, Stan, I just felt that peace in my heart. Knowing that everything is going to be well. And she went home. And the next thing I know, we passed one man in the stairs. The man was going up, and Brian introduced him as Jose. Jose had a walkie-talkie, and he was going to go rescue somebody, and Jose never made it out. And the next thing I know, we were in the ground floor, the lobby. And the only people we saw there were the firefighters and cops and the EMS workers. See, when the first building was hit, most people did not go in the office. Nobody knew that people were trapped from the 81st floor and upwards. After the 93 bombing, the nail shut the door that leads to the roof. They wanted to airlift us off on 93, but the wind was so heavy because they ruled out that possibility. They said the wind was going to knock everybody off their feet, just blow you off the floor. So the nail shut the door. Chances are the people made their way there, and they realized they can't go further up. Before they reach down, tragedy befalls. The only people we saw there were the firefighters and cops and EMS workers. 
and they were shouting, belching orders, go, 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 get out, get out, get out, run to liberty. Do not look up, do not look around. Go, go, go. And Brian and I started to run. I didn't know where to go. We were running. It looked like a scene from Forrest Gump. Go, go, go. The people are cheering, and we were running, and that one piece of fallen debris touched us. And we were running, going to liberty. Liberty then was a street. Today is total freedom. And as we were running, 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 arms in arms, we were running. I'm telling Brian, this is God's doing. I'm going to Trinity Church, and I don't know why Trinity Church. We were running, 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 and I bumped into the sky. A Catholic priest, he stood up like this. He was watching this spectacle. Looks like a monument smiling at grief. He just stood up there, smiling. What are you looking at? He, he was like mesmerized watching this whole thing. And the next thing I know, Brian told me, he says, do you remember what happened? I said, no. He said, you were babbling in a language I don't understand. That's what he said. And he said, the priest says, this man needs the hospital badly, but he needs prayer. And right there, they lay hands and pray for me. And the next thing I remember, I'm holding on to the fence of the Trinity Church. And I'm breathing hard, and I'm telling him, it's going. Stan, what you see burning there is draperies and cosmetic and paper. Steel don't bend. You're still in shock. And he stopped saying what he was saying because the building starts to sway so much we thought it was going to tilt over. You kind of look at the building. Oh, God, oh, God, it's going to tilt over. It's going to tilt. It's going to tilt. And it stopped and starts shaking again and went the other way. And it's tilting. It's tilting. It's tilting. And then it stopped. And you can feel this vibration on the ground like a trembling. And the building starts to tremble like this. And the next thing they know, the building starts to implode. One floor after the other. Boom, boom, boom. And the building went down. Because we were on the back side of the building, the blunt force of everything that went, poof, the church took the blunt force of whatever should have come to us. So every step of the way, the Lord was taking care of me. But let me tell you what was happening behind the scene. Pastor Jim was putting over the sanctuary that day, our pastor. Pastor Jim is my father-in-law, by the way. So I have no choice in doing what I do. He was putting up a sign with a group of guys, enter into his presence with thanksgiving. And the women were in church praying that day, and one of them had a radio, one of the guys, and they interrupted the program to say that there's a terrorist attack on the trade center. He says, guys, continue working. He went home, he told my mother-in-law, something is wrong with Stan. And they're watching TV. And later on, he said, on the stage one day, he said, he said, I preached faith for over 52 years as an AG minister. But my faith wavered when I saw that destruction of what was happening there. There's no way he could have gotten out or gotten out. But you know what? When God says it's not your day, whatever the devil means doesn't mean anything. Whatever he said doesn't mean anything. We serve a God who is big and powerful and able and who can do all things. And as the building imploded, with a thunderous sound, all hell broke loose. You heard that cliche before, but let me tell you what it means. As the building imploded, it created a large vacuum, and all the smoke that was in the cross street in the air, it dra dragged it towards the core. So it looks like a giant tsunami of smoke came in, and all the people who you were seeing roped around or enveloped in that smoke, and some people were cursing, some were swearing, some were praising God. They were, the ladies were taking off the high heel and throwing it away, and they were running, and they're not so able, they're getting trampled, and Brian and I got separated from each other. God, where's this man? In my heart, God sent this man to pull me out of there and then rain fire in Sodom and Gomorrah. His job is done. That was my guardian angel, and he was gone. But I can hear Stan, and I'm screaming for Brian. I can't see him. And in my heart, they're bombing the financial area. I got to go save Jenny. Jenny had worked with the New York Stock Exchange at the time, and their building was hidden over the Brooklyn Bridge. Never visited her because you got to go through three sets of metal detector. Never went to visit her. All I know is the dress. And I'm looking for something I got angry that day. Pastor, I got angry. I am looking for something I don't know what. I'm looking for something, but I got to go over the Brooklyn Bridge to get her to safety. And the first time in my life, I got this angry. And I saw a man driving a white 4x4 pickup truck. I ran alongside, yanked the door open, says, one word for you, you're dead. The man looks at me, thinks I'm a terrorist because I lost my shirt. It looks like it came from my, my undershirt. looked like it came from a shredder. My pants stood intact. My shoe was okay, covered in blood. The man reached on top of his dashboard, picked up a white box of cigarettes. that says, here, smoke. I said, no, man, I had enough smoke for one day. <laughs> and, 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 
and he looked at me and he smiled. I says, go! He said, we're to Brooklyn Bridge. He drove on top of the sidewalks and everything, reached a ramp of the Brooklyn Bridge. I yanked the door open, thank you. I hobbled. And I'm running, get out of my way, get out of my way. 55,000 people works at the straight side of 40,000 on top of the bridge. Man turned around to compassion to me, what happened to you? I said, man, I just came up from that building. He said, my name is Albert de Leon. I'm a senior counsel for French Bank. Ask me for anything. I was in Vietnam. I'm like, all right. I said, tell me how to get to two Metro Tech Center. He says, I live right behind that building. What is that chance? 40,000 people, you bump into the right man who knows exactly where you got to go. That is God's doing. I said, but I'm not going. Why are you not going? I said, because they hot wire the bridge. Everybody's going to die. So he looks at me. If I'm crazy now. So we sat down. And the people are running, jumping over us, they're screaming, get out, get out, get out. And they're running, helter skelter. And he said, tell me, can you hear those sounds above? Yeah. And you can hear the F-16s hovering over lower Manhattan. What is that? I said, that is Uncle Sam taking care of business. He said, well, come on, let's go. And we got up and start to run. And we reach the lobby of the building where Jenny works, and the security guard looks at me and took out his guard stick, and I took a karate stand and says, come on. And he backed down. I, I dabbled around a little bit with Kempo. Kempo is that dangerous art where you're the bad guy. And Albert was making so much noise. All the man wants to see is Jennifer from the legal department. And the security people came. They were standing up in front of me, and we were kind of judging each other. The next thing I know, a guy came, pushed them apart. What are you all doing? Stan is a good guy. Greg Langan, my wife's boss at the time. He was a senior counsel for the stock exchange. And, um, this guy, this guy did an act of kindness that I will go to the grave remembering. I had no shirt, and this man, Greg, took out his white shirt, and he says, here, Stan, you can have my shirt. He says, give this man anything he wants. Make him well. I don't have the time here to spend with you. We have an emergency general counsel meeting, but make him well. And a nurse came instead, and she gave me one of her jackets. I gave back Greg his shirt, and he was gone. If this Bible, Bible was to be written in modern times, this man would have been the Samaritan. He was gone. And the nurse tried her best, you know, patch me up a little bit. And he says, Stan, I can't send you home. They shut down the parkway and these trains are not running. And she insisted that I take her water and sandwich and apple that she brought for lunch. No. And I took the water and said, put it in my pocket. She says, you need the hospital badly. I says, no, if I can only speak to Jenny, I'll be fine. I just want to hear her voice. I'll be well. But I can't remember our home number. I can't remember it for the love of God. I went crazy. I says, give me a phone. I'm dialing. Can't remember the number. And the number pops in my head, and here is Jenny. W what are you doing? Who is this? What are you playing games for? She thought somebody was impersonating me. Please don't do this. My husband is dead. Man, when you hear those words, and you're still alive, it would tear you apart. So now nah, the Lord took care of me. I'm coming home to you girls. And I hung up that phone. And the nurse says, come on, let me walk you down the subway. Well, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but why would you walk me down the subway if the subway is shut down? But I found myself there next to the A train, just where I got to go. We stood there for like seven, eight minutes. And the only way I can explain this miracle it was like magic. A train pulls up. What is that chance? The same train that you want the train is there. The door opens up right where I was standing, and I stepped in, and the door closes, or closed, and it looked in retrospect as if this train just came for me. And the lady could not believe her eyes, and she had her hands on her mouth, and she's running alongside the train as the train is going away, waving me goodbye. And I reach home. Well, I reach where I parked. And then I realize as I open up the car that I can't fit because the seat belt can't buckle me up, I'm swollen. And I'm thinking, oh my God, today I will get a ticket of all the things. Well, I reached home. When I got there, Jenny is standing with the children. 
Stephanie in one hand, Caitlin in the other hand, and she's holding on to these precious children. Stephanie was eight and a half, Caitlin was four. And all the neighbors came out and they hugged me and they kissed me and, oh, Stan, thank God, thank God you're saved. And I walked up and as I walked towards that child, that child starts screaming, please don't touch me, you're not my daddy. The child could not recognize me and she's screaming, hiding behind my wife. Man, when you hear that, those words, it would just tear you apart. And Stephanie, that child, just had a, a sandwich and she had a butter knife in one hand and the child says, Dad, if you didn't come home, I was going to kill myself. And when that child said what she said after all that I went through, didn't mean anything. I just remember I hugged Jenny and the girls and I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, because that day I left home with a prayer in my heart and now it's time for rejoicing. The next thing I know, a doctor is leaning over me, and he's on the phone with somebody. At the time, I didn't know, then I realized it was his brother he is telling, that this man is here, and I heard the most bizarre story. And the brother told him, he says, ask him, says, what's the man's name? He said, he said his name is Stan. Is that Brother Stan? I can hear the conversation. Well, if that's Brother Stan, he told you the truth, because he's my tax accountant. So one brother is a tax accountant and another one is, my doc, is a doctor. And I didn't know that they were related. And the doctor told me, he said, I've given you medication that should knock you out. But I couldn't sleep. My adrenaline was pumping so much it was overriding medication. And I was afraid to go to sleep that the bad guy's gonna come. And I just lost my mind. I lost my speaking vocabulary. I couldn't recognize anybody, and my system just shut down. And I was in that state for a little bit. I would see it for like a week. Couldn't recognize Jenny and the girls, and I'm wondering, what are these children doing in the house? They don't have a home to go to. Who's this strange woman that I would have to go to bed with if my wife gets to know I'm dead, so I'm not going to sleep there? And the next thing I know, I'm watching TV. And the newscaster is saying 911 is the emergency number. And she's going on. And I can hear Pastor Jim is preaching his heart out and he's saying 911 is an emergency number. All the answers to life is in the Bible. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. 911, an emergency number. Yes, yes. And I said, Jen, give me my Bible. And she looks at me. Oh, you can talk again. But she's scared, like you can see. And she's stretching her hand like this, giving me the Bible. I had a King James zipper around Bible. And I start turning frantically. And I'm looking for 911. And the, play, the, the Bible was loosing apart. All the leaves were falling out. And it stopped on Psalm 91, verse 1. And I'm reading. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. My God. I'm reading. And he shall give his angels charges over thee to keep it in all thy ways. And I'm reading. And under his wings, he's going to shadow me. And I'm reading down, and he shall call, and I will hear. I will answer him. Go on to say, with long life shall I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And I snapped out. I'm able to recognize faces and people and everything. And I says, praise the Lord. And after that, Went back to the doctor. The doctor says, you're fine. But you have to go counseling. And I went counseling the first day. When I went counseling, the counselor said, tell me why you're here. You can lie down, sit down, stand up, do whatever you want. Just be comfortable. Tell me why you're here. And by the time I told her, she was in tears. I ended up telling her about the grace of God, and she accepted Christ. Right there. <laughs> After that incident, after that incident, witnessing to people became very easy because I had a story to tell. And I've been telling that story since then, and I never stopped. And for, for invitations, I've been traveling around the country telling people this story. So if you never see me back again, rest assured, I'm in another state, in another church, in another college, in another government office, telling people about God and His grace. 
You see, he brought me out from the miry clay. He set my feet in the rock to stay. We used to sing the song. He put a song in my soul, a song of praise. Hallelujah. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And I want to tell you, I am in good health. I have no problems. I don't have any physical con condition. I don't have any emotional problem. So you might be going through whatever you're going through. Rest assured, if you lean your cares on the Lord, leave it at the foot of the cross. He is able to take care of all your shortcomings. You live in hope that he is God and he can do all things. I'm telling you, you leave it there. He is willing to fight your battles and you're going to have that victory. You don't have to carry that cross because he carried it for you. He broke the chains and you were free. Hallelujah. We are serving a God who hears and answers problem. And if you call with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, he is going to hear. You may never understand why some people call to God and he doesn't answer at the same time. I can tell you, I call on my God. And he heard and he sent some people my way. And I am a witness to that testimony that my God hears and answers prayer. And my God lives. And because he lives, I live. And we live with that blessed hope that he's going to come one day to take us to him. Until that day, you are supposed to be a prayerful people, a people giving thanks. I want to be that one leper who stopped to say, thank you, Lord. I don't want to be healed and walk away running, jumping. I want to go back and say, thank you, Lord. I want to go back and say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to go with you. I want to tell of your goodness. I want to tell of your deliverance. I want to tell of that miracle. And I am telling of that miracle today of my God, my God who lives and hears and answers prayers. You might be going through some traumatic situation today. You might be going through a situation where the wife or the husband leaves and walk out. You might be going through a situation where the children doesn't want to hear anything about God. But let me tell you something. You are here right now. And that God that Stanley calls, you can call on that same God. Rest assured that he is going to answer that problem. All you got to do is put up your hands or stand up just where you are. I'm not going to call you in front of here, but I want to tell you that if you want to leave it here today and walk through that door, knowing that your God is going to take care of it, just stand just where you are. I see one person. I see many people standing up here. And I want to tell you that you who are standing here know that you're in the right place because this is your day. This is your time of deliverance. Now is the moment. Now is your time. This is the season. I want to tell you that you're in the right place, not because you wanted to be here. You're here by divine providence. You're here before the foundation of the earth. The Lord knows that you are going to stand. The Lord knows that Stanley is going to be here. And he knows that today he is going to make all things right. And today is your day. Now is that time. And you're going to walk out here victorious today. You're going to walk out knowing that today, my God intervened on my behalf. And as pastor comes, he's going to pray for you, and all things are going to be well. Bow your hearts with me.